Marines in the Air Force. My name is uh, William Stephen Doinger. Uh, this is Staff Sergeant in the Air Force. Uh, um, so did you enlist or were you drafted? I enlisted. Why did you choose the Air Force? Well, back in uh, 1966, when uh, the war was fully escalating, I decided that uh, my best chance to stay alive was to go Air Force Road. Also, I wasn't college bound, so I decided that in order to get something working with my hands, I'd go in the Air Force for uh, mechanical training of some sort or something to be on the air. What kind of training did you receive? I was an aircraft maintenance specialist. I worked on jet aircraft. Um, you said in your sworn that you remember your first training officer well. How did he kind of impact you? Uh, his impact to me was, uh, I mean, you have to remember now, it's just no older than you guys. And uh, being 18, I didn't know which direction to go. And he said that education is important and the fact that even in the Air Force, if you get as much as you can from them, that it'll pay in the life. Uh, and it did. He said that if I was to receive my five level, which in the Air Force you got different grades and level of education, and you went overseas to Vietnam, you would uh, eventually make rank very quick, and it's so paid off. How long after you joined were you shipped out to Vietnam? Exactly one year. Uh, what part of Vietnam were you in? Saigon, Han Sung Air Base. Um, why were you chosen as a mechanic? Uh, well, when you go into airman basic training, uh, they give you a dream sheet, they call it. You get a dream sheet twice, actually. And uh, you have three choices, whichever you want to do. And I picked aircraft maintenance, uh, I picked uh, pneumatics and hydraulics, and I picked air conditioning and refrigeration. I picked those because I thought they'd be great on the outside after I got done with my four years, and uh, as it paid off, it did. Did you have any experience in high school? Just uh, the normal shop classes. We call them shop. Uh, what were some of your basic duties? Basic, well, my basic duty was as an aircraft maintenance specialist, which was you were in charge of one aircraft wherever you were stationed, and you would maintain that aircraft with all the specialists working around you, and you called the shots. You, if it was a hydraulic problem, you worked with that person until it was fixed, or you assisted and made sure it was operational ready. Maybe you could tell us about some of the things that you worked on. Okay. Well, uh, coming out of tech school, I went to Shaw Air Force Base where I worked on the RF uh, 101. That was the aircraft I also worked on in Vietnam. Uh, it was a reconnaissance fighter, two-engine fighter, single-seater, and uh, all it did was did recon. Did recon for the ground troops, uh, recon for the after bombing missions. And uh, it was a big part of the war. What did that feel like that you worked on? Oh, no. After that, I uh, came back to the stateside where I worked on the 101 Interceptor down in Long Island, uh, Suffolk County Air Force Base, which Griffiths also had the uh, 101s, but when I got up here, they were changing over to the 106 Delta Dart, which I worked on. Also had experience in the uh, F-105 over in Nam a little bit, assisted on that. I was about most of the time. Um, you said you were, you said that on your third week you went through your first rocket and motor pack. What was that like? Uh, that, again, being Air Force, we had the safest conditions being on a big base. The, the base was as big as you can get being near Saigon. Uh, had a lot of offshoots to it. Well, we uh, were on our way to midnight chow. They fed you all the time over in Vietnam. I don't know why, but... And, uh, I was in country just three weeks and uh, never experienced anything like that. We got on the back of the pickup truck, took us to Chow, and on the way back from Chow, right in the middle of the flight line, they started a mortar and rocket us. And as they were bouncing them off the runway, we were scrambling to find foxholes. And uh, we used to call them uh, sandbag city. They were big convex boxes, and they all had sandbags on them. Well, fortunately, when I got to the, uh, unfortunately, when I got to one of those, they were completely full. So my med best thing I could do was just run and stay alongside as long as I could to the ground as they were flying and bombing and everything. But the amazing thing about it is the, 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 is the concussion and the noise level. Uh, you could take your worst thunderstorm 
of a 105 rocket and have it go 50 yards from them, and it would be about eight times worse, worse than the lightning bolt you ever used. It just pick you off the ground, shake you, throw you back down again. Fortunately, everything went over the top of me and I was still hostile. Could you explain some of the duties you performed on your ship? Uh, just, again, working on the aircraft, we worked uh, four days on, one off, 12-hour shifts. And I elected to work a graveyard shift, which is 6 o'clock at night to 6 in the morning, because I wanted to be awake when all the stuff was coming in. I didn't want to be in my bunk and go to take a breath, take and sign out, you know. I wanted to be up and around where I had the mobility to get around to where I wanted to go. Some of my duties were just repair the aircraft because I got busted up during the day and so forth. So. Was the 12 hour night shift tiring though? Uh, yes and no. It was tiring when we were in the hot season because you couldn't sleep during the day. You averaged about three hours sleep because it was so hot we didn't have air conditioning. We slept out in an open day barracks and uh, you know, 110, 115 degrees with humidity that Vietnam had, you didn't see anything. And plus you had afternoon guys, day shift guys m moping around because they had the day off and it was just very discouraging. So yes, you got tired. Mm -hmm. yes. What did you do during the day? On my off days, you'd take in a movie, go to the gym. Unfortunately, being by Saigon, you had downtown. You could go downtown, but they had curfews. You had to be in off the streets before dark. And uh, downtown, they had... They had a zoo, they had shopping, and of course, being young GI, you wanted to run the bars. We ran the bars and had a good time. Um, did everyone get three good meals? Yeah, Air Force was exceptional. Uh, we had actually four. You had your basic three meals, and then we had this thing, which I was telling you about earlier, called Midnight Chow. And it was for the guys that worked graveyard. And you could go and either have a full complimentary breakfast or a meal of your choice. I always went for that, just to get off the work detail and because uh, we had a lot of side details we had to do also. What did the meals consist of? Uh, regular good food. They flew it in every day from Okinawa, Japan. We had regular meats, none of this in a can stuff like our poor Army Marine fellas had. Uh, very fortunate during the holidays we had turkey, hams on Easter. They never begrudged the Air Force. Force was probably your best military for, and it is today for their service and the way they treat their people. You, s you mentioned that your equipment was by far the best. What was it? Well, our aircraft, other than Russian made makes, as I stated in that interview, uh, we were superior in the air. Uh, uh, the, our cameras were the latest from the Kodak. Uh, anything that was on that aircraft, we had readily available to us. Planes were never down, like during World War II, when they couldn't get parts. Our parts were always maintainable. We had excellent uh, periodic inspections where they kept the aircraft up. In fact, we had one plane that was sh had a mid-air collision with another plane during a dogfight, and uh, came back with its whole nose missing, and the other plane came in with its wing missing. We had them up and running in uh, four days. Our unit was the uh, 45th uh, Tactical Reconnaissance Squadron. Uh, we had uh, 22 aircraft in it. They were all one-seater RF-10C, uh, excuse me, RF-101Cs. Uh, they all ran like tops. We kept them in good shape. Everybody worked as a good team. And uh, can't say it was fun, but it was an, an adventure. Were mechanics ever issued any weapons? Yes, we were. We were issued weapons uh, three times when they thought uh, we were going to be overrun by the Viet Cong. Uh, what would happen is on the outside perimeters, they would uh, mass, and before our uh, gunships could get up there and clear them out, they'd put up a red alert, and we'd uh, be handed guns to protect our equipment, mostly. Um, what major events in the war took place while you were in Vietnam? Uh, I, fortunately, I missed the Tet Offensive, maybe you fellas have ever heard of that. That was the largest offensive on Tonsonut Air Base, where they actually overran the base. We had to take it back. But I missed that by two months. I got there October, and it happened in July of 
1968. Uh, the other things uh, were uh, just uh, everyday politicking, and that's about all we ever heard about it. And being a young man, I didn't really pay attention to it. Just wanted to get home. Did you ever feel threatened or humiliated? Yes, numerous times. Uh, for some reason, I always put the flight line out in the, the boonies, we'll call it, away from the, where the people lived and where the uh, actual base was, so that if there was ever an assault on the base, or we would lose the aircraft and our personnel. And uh, three times I had threats. Um, we had a spot where we had to trim the engines up for full power. It was called the trim pad. I was out there with an engine troop one night, and uh, the security police, which is equivalent to your, your guard people, uh, came uh, screaming up in their vehicles, all fully uh, loaded and locked and ready, and uh, they said that they had Viet Cong, senses of Viet Cong, tunneling their way in. The Viet Cong had a way of digging tunnels, big tunnel systems during Vietnam, and they start out maybe a mile out, and they'll tunnel for days until they get under the fences and out. And uh, when the sensors out in the fields, kill zone they used to call it, went off, they knew they were coming. All we had to do was wait for when they come. So we had to kill the lights and just hug the ground. And we weren't issued weapons. What they did is they gave us uh, a small detachment of guards to protect us. And then uh, they waited till they surfaced. When they surfaced, uh, I can still remember this plain as day, they uh, launched the dogs out, which are Doberman Pinschers and uh, German Shepherds. And the dogs went out and uh, locked them, loaded them, uh, shoot them up. So they so our men could get out there. The reason why our men just couldn't go out there and arrest them was because of uh, everything was mined by them. We didn't know how that worked. In fact, that same kill zone, sometimes the uh, water buffalo from outside the perimeter would break down the fence and come in, and all of a sudden you hear boom, and uh, there'd be a water buffalo stepping on a landmine. So it'd be one of these that fresh meat, you know. Um, you said that I never had to use it. I, uh, the one red alert we had, they, they actually had an assault. Fortune was out by the perimeter, and uh, the station that I had, we had munitions. We were locked and loaded, and so we barely did it out of the fire. We never saw a target. Did you witness any horrors at, of the war firsthand? Uh, not, as an Air Force personnel, uh, no. We weren't out in the, the fields doing the actual assault, but the worst horror I saw was uh, when you're down by the hospital and you saw the uh, med buses loaded with Army personnel, Marine personnel, and whoever else, all shot up. That was sad. It was sad. Bus, but bus after bus after bus away from the medevac planes they come in. That's all real horror I saw. Reading up on Vietnam, you learned about Agent Orange. Funny you mention that. I've just been uh, declared a, uh, a uh, how can I say, disability from Agent Orange. I have uh, developed diabetes and uh, high blood pressure. The VA has awarded me a settlement and uh, given me a 20% disability from that injury. Were you any? Were there any comical situations that stand out in your mind while you were in Vietnam? Excuse me. Were there any comical situations that stand out in your mind from Vietnam? Well, uh, this hat, I'll tell it all. This is what we called, uh, shouldn't be preaching this because I know things have changed, but this is our party hat. Every time we have a party, you wore this hat, and every guy in the service had one of these. And you rock and roll. We had a great time. And uh, there's story after story. We played cards. We went down to the club. We had excellent clubs. We had great entertainment, as you'll see in my photos. Uh, we really took care of the Air Force people very well. Do you think you can explain some of the patches that sure. are? Sure, sure. Well, I was a great Chevrolet fan. You know, in the 50s and 60s, hot rods were very popular. And uh, I had a 57 Chevy, 
full out engine in, four speed, the whole nine yards. And I was a Chevy man, so of course I had to keep that up because like you guys might have rivalries now, we had them back then between Pontiacs and the Chevys and the Fords and the Plymouths and the whatever, and the Chevy Google did in our day. And this is uh, what we were. We were voodoo medicine men. The voodoo is the nickname for the 101. And uh, that was our patch that we had on our uniforms also. This here was our, uh, the polka dot squadron, the 45th TRS. That was our patch for our squadron. And again, this one here was a little pin that we got. And uh, my nickname was Willie. You know how you have a call name on a CB? Everybody had a nickname. So when you yelled down the flight line, Willie, RV, whatever they, you know, they called me Willie. And uh, of course, the Vietnam, we saw me after that. Just a good time. Uh, like I said, between playing cards, going to the clubs, going downtown, I had a lot of good times too. Uh, 35 years ago is a long time to remember names, but I have some good buddies in the pictures there. You know, never saw them again. You can leave country, gone. Never write, never nothing. New life, new phase of life. Do you think you can explain this right here? Oh, okay. I, uh, That was from my mom when I first got over there. This is Tella, lover of misery. And uh, she put it on the uh, living room wall. Everybody knew where it was. Any other seconds? No, oh, just a couple. Um, you seem to have earned many awards during your time in service. Could you describe some of them? Well, just the, uh, everyone received basic awards. I didn't get bronze stars or silver cross or anything, but just a combination medal for doing a good job is the combination uh, award statement says. Uh, just about everybody got these. Uh, our squadron was uh, really loaded with awards. They received the Presidential Citation, the Outstanding Unit Citation, the Vietnam Flying Distinguished Union Award. I can go on and on. Uh, as I was telling your teacher, uh, in 1993 I had a house robbery, and the person that broke in the house took all my artifacts from my safe, and uh, he was the only two he left behind. Why he, I don't know, but he took all my ribbons, he took everything that was there. Glue my door pants, and I had those to show you if I put it on. So, uh, yeah, had about nine awards, fellas. Well, Mark just pointed out your jacket, so. Oh, yeah. So we'll point to the jacket. Okay. The, the jacket was just a uh, souvenir that most of the guys had. I didn't wear it after the war because we weren't accepted back in country when we came home. A lot of people hated the people from Vietnam. So when I bought this, it was a, just something I can remember. It says, when I die, I'll go to heaven because I'm serving my time in hell. Vietnam. Uh, probably 90% of the guys got a jacket like this, no matter what service they were in, to remind them what it was like on the Everything was cheap over there, guys. I'll tell you that much. Uh, guys only ran about six bucks. At what point during your service were you assigned to the Griffith Air Force Base? Uh, in my uh, last uh, 24 months. I came back from Vietnam, and uh, again, you get a dream sheet, uh, and it gives you three bases that you can choose. And I picked uh, Suffolk County Air Force Base, which is 30 minutes from my home originally from uh, Huntington, Long Island. And uh, just as I got on base, I was there 10 days, uh, President uh, Johnson closed the base. As we went through the break here in Griffiths, uh, they closed the base. And uh, I figured, well, if I stay in New York, I'll be okay, so I elected to come to Griffiths, which actually was further than I could have gone to uh, New Jersey and gone to McGuire Air Force Base and worked there and would have been closer to home. But 
it all worked out because here I met my wife, and I like I like our hometown a lot, and it's really been cool. Once you were discharged from the Air Force, did it hurt you to find a job? Uh, actually, I used my VA benefits and uh, became a machinist. I took the apprenticeship. I'm now a journeyman machinist. And, uh, it paid off. Well, I used I went to NBCC for uh, two years of. Uh, technical uh, college in math and mechanical drawing, things of that nature, welding, and also my machinist apprenticeship, which I do today at Bucktail Machinist. How did your experience in the service come to be you now? Uh, it, it just makes you a better guy. I mean, with all the rules and regulations I know you kids have in school, you're probably saying these teachers are nuts, but all they're doing is grooming you to become good citizens. And the same with the military. Everything is regimented. You cannot do anything without having a policy or something in writing that before you can do it. And it just wears off on you. So as you go into civilian life, it sticks in the back of your mind. You actually become like a semi-perfectionist. I don't have any nightmares like a lot of the fellas do. I uh, I like to talk about it, but I didn't have the horror stories like a lot of them have. So it doesn't affect me emotionally except for my mom. Uh, but uh, no, I can talk about playing openly. Uh, wasn't a bad time for me at all. I had good duty, I had three round meals, good barracks. Uh, they were upset, but they knew where I was coming from. They knew that I wasn't college-bound material. You know, back in the 60s, only, I'd say, 20% of the seniors went to college. And they were mostly because their parents had money. Uh, most of the kids went out to the workforce or they uh, elected to go in the military. With Vietnam being heated up, as I said, uh, I elected to go in because I needed uh, some kind of career. And I knew the Air Force or the Navy would have given that to me. So I did. I just didn't want to be a, an infantryman anymore. You know, just wanted to get something out of it. I thought being uh, this jet mechanic uh, stuff would pay off, but as I got out in 1971, uh, we had the oil embargo. You learn about that in history? Mm -hmm. And the airlines, as they're doing now, half of them folded. There were no jobs in aircraft maintenance. I was going to go to a maintenance school to get my FAA license and become a mechanic on air, aircraft, uh, commercial aircraft. Uh, it didn't work out for me, so I elected to do the uh, machinist trade. Out of all the air groups, <laughs> the air yeah, 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 that's all there. All set? Yeah, yeah, you can start, please. covered the one on the trim pad where they were tunneling it in, but uh, another experience I had was uh, I was out on the trim pad again by myself, and uh, like I said, it was quite a distance away, uh, waiting for the engine specialist to come, and uh, we had a rocket attack and a mortar attack. And uh, the Vietnamese were shrewd people. They would tunnel in and be hidden so our people couldn't pick them up, our spotters, they call them. And uh, so they actually were leaving the ground. And, uh, when they started bouncing, one hit about maybe uh, almost 75 yards right from my aircraft because we used to have the uh, aircraft lights on the aircraft so we could see what we were doing. So that made you stand out in this open field like, uh, here I am. And, uh, that's just what they did. They, they pinpoint on that and start lobbing stuff in at you. Well, again, being only a young man, uh, petrified. Grabbed my helmet, my black vest, and ran for the bunker that was there and uh, rode it out. And uh, again, things were rattling around your ears, and the noise and the concussions were unbelievable. But they never did hit the aircraft or myself. By then, once they spot the tracer leaving from the uh, rocket and that, 
our position is either from the air or from the ground would go after that assault uh, and level it. Take it out. So that would be safe. Uh, another uh, thing I had was uh, it's kind of comical, but it's sad too because it happened downtown Saigon on one of my days off. It was just getting near dark, and we were late for curfew already. We should have been off back on the base. But we were screwing around like young guys. And uh, three of us come out of a bar, and uh, we heard a ruckus up the road, and there were uh, three Green Berets up there. And uh, they were getting uh, harassed by uh, three of the local Saigon people. And uh, all of a sudden, come about. 12 to 15 motorcycles. Now, back then they had these uh, motorcycle gangs called the uh, Saigon Cowboys. And what they would do is they, they stopped the taxis or the uh, jitneys, as we called them, the little sickles that we rode on, and uh, beat the living heck out of them or killed them, whatever they could. And uh, that's what we always went in teams of five to meet their old time. Well, as these three Green Berets were down there, uh, they were getting harassed. Here come 20 of these uh, motorcycle guys. They thought they were going to kick these guys' tails, so to speak. Well, the uh, Green Berets have a little special fighting stuff. They took all 20 of them on, 11, 11. But the, the, the sad thing about it was they must, one of the guys must have freaked out because he picked up the motorcycle and all, just took it and took out like five of them, just like you see on uh, TV. And, uh, you know, it, it really does happen. The adrenaline pumps. Guy probably just came in from out of the field. Are you monkey with the monkey? We thought maybe we'd have to go and assist him. Glad we didn't have to, but uh, you know, you do what you got to do to help your fellow uh, buddy there. That was uh, how it was. That's about all the real assaults I had. Other than being maybe possibly run over uh, by another taxi cab or uh, whatever. When we, when we were downtown, you used to ride these uh, things called uh, cyclopes. I don't know if I have any pictures of them or not. What they were, it was a, a, like a basket on two wheels, like a three-wheel tricycle. And you sat in the front with your buddy, and then in the back, on a bicycle-looking motorcycle thing, was the driver. Now, you're going down Saigon, which is equivalent to New York City, with all these trucks and trips. And he's buzzing through there, so you put your life in your own hands riding one of them. And, uh, Many a time, you'd be going along and there'd be a 10-wheeler next to you. You'd, be, you'd see the tread marks going right by your ear because they didn't care. All they wanted is get you there, to get back, to pick another GI up so they make the money. You know? It was quite comical. That's what I meant by putting your life in your hands riding one of those. But uh, it, it was amazing. It was amazing. Well, when you turn uh, 18 years old, back in the, those days, and I, I imagine it was during World War II, too, uh, you had to register with the draft. Do you fellows have to register now? No. No, okay. And the draft was a way they filled the military. And uh, when Vietnam started in the uh, early 60s, they needed the military beefed up, so they would... Uh, at the local boards, select certain numbers that you got. And if you got the nod, you had to go. And that's the way it worked. Uh, later on, in 1971, 72 maybe, they came out with the draft lottery, where they used your birthday. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, and that's how they selected them. So my brother-in-law, fortunately, got number 365. And he never got selected because they didn't need as many men for the, or women for the uh, armed forces. So he beat the draft that way. But during our time period between the uh, draft dodgers and the people that were trying to get out of the military by going to college, uh, another exemption was if you got married and had children, you didn't have to go in the military. Uh, a lot of people were getting married young and having kids right away, so they wouldn't have to go in. But uh, that's how they did it. And I knew that if I didn't enlist in the Air Force, I'd be drafted soon later, and it's the truth, because my uh, draft notice came that December after I enlisted in October for the Army. I wanted no part of the Army. Uh, 
what happened was after you draft and you uh, you go to what they call the uh, pre-screening, your, your physical, down at one of the local boards. I had to go to Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn uh, to take your physical. And, uh, I enlisted, so I was safe. But what they did is they line up about 300 of us. And uh, they'd say, all the Navy, Coast Guard, and uh, Air Force personnel take two steps back. And they call a step back. And that left all the guys that were open harvest for the Army there, standing there. And what they did during my section was they went one, two, three, Marine, one, two, three, Marine. And that's the first time that I can remember they were drafting into the Marines. And if you got drafted into the Marines, that wasn't good. That wasn't good at all. Because the Marines and Army took the hardest hit casualty wise. We didn't want to do that. Tom, do you think you can expand some of the pictures that you sure. have? Well, here, this one where I'm fooling around, so mom knew I was safe. Uh, it's just uh, the one of the little bunkers we had, had the name of the squadron and all there. Here's one of our parties. This was a promotion party, you can see here. The fellas who just made sergeant. Did hats, I was talking about? Okay. There was an encounter I didn't tell you about. See this bunker? Now, all the, all the GIs on an uh, on air base, we had the women of the Vietnamese come in and take care of our laundry, do our cleaning, because we worked such long hours, we couldn't do that and keep up the base regulations of being spit polish and all that stuff. So you would pay $10 a month. And Mama San, that's what we called them, would come in and... Uh, Keep everything in order. Clean your little cubicle, uh, make your bed, do your laundry, make sure your uniforms are pressed and all that. Because we still had to play the military role of being spit shines, even over in Vietnam. Haircuts, the whole nine yards. Uh, but the worst thing about this was that some of the Vietnamese mama sons acted as doubles and were actually Viet Cong. And what they would do is, when they got free time and could sneak into these bunkers, they'd place razor blades in. So when we'd have a mortar attack or a shelling, we'd go running in there from waking up barefoot and cut our feet and limbs. Now, uh, one of the stories I have was uh, they caught one of these people. And uh, our, the United States couldn't do anything about it. So what we did is we turned them over to the South Koreans. And the South Koreans would take care of it. What happened to that woman? No clue. All we know is they took her off. I would imagine she was well in hand. That was another thing. Uh, that happened numerous times when I was over there. Uh, the other threat we had over there was uh, uh, just life in general. The uh, snakes. They had the little crate snake, the crate family. We used to call them the two-steppers. And they would slither from the field. I have some other pictures here. Well, you can see how close the field are to the line the fence line. Uh, that, again, was the kill zone for us by our barracks. And uh, they would slither in and get in our barracks. Well, if they bit you with two seconds or two steps, whatever it took, you'd be dead. It's called the crate snake. We had king cobras come into our barracks. And all you would do is you'd try to confine them without disturbing them, call the security police, and they'd come and they'd uh, rassle them up or shoot them on the spot. We had nasty spiders over there that would, could hurt you, foot pain, and you had to shake out your bed linens every day before you got in to check your shoes and whatnot. And it, it wasn't a happy culture. You can see the life of the Air Force. That was my barracks right there. See, it's pretty nice. Barracks. I mean, the Air Force people were taken care of. You know what I mean? But that was our choice. The Army guys decided to go out in the field, have a ball. I had a great, great duty. Uh, there's the mama sons I was telling you about. You doing laundry? Okay. There was nothing to find a mama son in the morning. You go in to take your shower, and a mama son would be in a garbage can taking her shower. That's how she covered up. But when a GI would come, she'd just pull a lid over her head. But she would use our hot water to 
they shot him because they were so, uh, they weren't nice things to look at, trust me. <laughs> they, you didn't care about that, so just go about your business. Uh, uh, this was an experience, fellas. Let me get these pictures here. This is the uh, opening of our barracks. You see all the black smoke? Uh, just over that fence that I showed you earlier, there was a heliport, an army heliport. It had maybe over 300 helicopters. And uh, this helicopter was coming in and lost a rotor blade. So what you hear is a big <laughs> And then it crashed just outside, maybe uh, oh, not even 50 yards. That wasn't so bad about the crashing, but what was happening was fully loaded with armament. So when that, the flares and the 50 caliber started cooking off, the shells were buzzing over our heads. And uh, it got kind of kind of spooky there. But uh, again, we just hit the deck. We hit sandbags all around us, and uh, that worked out pretty good. There, there's the fire, you can see that. See how close to the barracks it was? Now, I was a pretty... Sure. That's okay. back to the helicopter, you can see the big ball of flame. But that's mostly munitions and the fuel from the uh, helicopter crash. And, uh, fortunately, uh, the crew all got out. As it was, when a helicopter loses its blade, of course, it goes in a big circle. And uh, the guys were low enough because they were coming in for a landing that they just jumped ship and let it just crash. They lucked out. Everybody was okay. Uh, there's a picture of the aircraft we worked on. That's a 101, RF 101. And again, what my job duty was, was to maintain all the little uh, other specialists working on it. You might have airframe, which is the uh, structural part of the thing, hydraulics, electrical, communications. And I had to put them people all in order, how they were going to fix a plane. And that was my responsibility, uh, being a crew chief. That's what we were called. We kind of like the, uh, they used to give us a nickname of just uh, windshield washer. But when we had the SIS, we had the SIS. And we had a lot of other duties to do, too. Uh, did you work well with employee or your civilian colleagues? Yeah, the other specialists? Yeah, the aircraft maintenance specialists? Yeah, yeah. This is one of our duties. This is putting liquid oxygen into the aircraft. This is one of the things you do. It's called servicing the aircraft for flight. We did that every night. Because, you know, these planes flew about anywhere from 40,000 40, to 50,000 feet high. You know, they had no munitions on them. They had no protection, so when they would take off, all they had were their cameras. They'd take off, and then they'd be escorted by uh, F-4s, 105s, and uh, they'd go to their target, take their pictures, and then come back, and hope they made it back safe. And many a time, our planes would come back with bullet holes in them from MiGs and other aircraft that were firing on them. The Russians back then had a big part in supporting communistic uh, role and uh, they, su su they supplied the North Vietnamese and the people with some aircraft. They, they did a lot of damage to it. Uh, there's a that's downtown Saigon. Yeah, it's a regular city. Wouldn't think there was a war going on. It had uh, one street called Tudo Street. That was our party street. It had uh, 81 bars on it. And that's all you could do, guys. Drink and be happy and try to forget the war. And uh, that's what, about what we did. Uh, I wouldn't eat down there because the food was uh, disgusting. And I wouldn't trust who's touching it or anything. So I always ate on base. And, uh, uh, that kill zone I'm telling you about, is that's what it looked like. That's what the Agent Orange did. See all the sand? It leveled everything. Nothing would grow there. And uh, they would spray that. If it wasn't that, it was the uh, mosquito stuff. And, uh, we had entertainment there. Now that's a f that that's what the plane looked in one night, taking all apart. We used to have to get the plane what they call operational ready by the morning. That was my job. You asked me before what my specialties were. Uh, they come with bad radio or bad engine, bad something. And I'd have to make sure that by morning it was ready to go. And that was what I had to do. You know, what was 
system for the aircraft. Sometimes it looked like that. And uh, right there, you see the nose up? That's where the big cameras are. They had nose, cameras in the nose, on the belly, and in the air. So when they would swoop down and take a picture of a blown up bridge, to get a front center and aft of all the destruction that we did. Or new targets. There's pictures of the F-4s that were our uh, escorts. They were regular fighter bombers. They were fully loaded. Uh, <coughs> that's another little scary thing. Uh, when you're walking the flight line, uh, they would have a fully armored uh, F-4 loaded and uh, you have the radar on, and the radar would pick you up, and it would actually follow you. You could watch the radar screen follow you, and as it's doing that, the guns would follow you too. And, and you just hope to God they didn't go off, because that's when they had power on it, when you're doing radar checks. Again, that's another picture of the barracks. This was the, uh, on base, just outside our base, Hansen was the Vietnamese officers club. And we were allowed to go in there and drink and eat as if, you know, because they were our friends, you know, South Vietnamese. You know, we used to go there a lot. Good times. Uh, that's a zoo, there's a tiger. You could go down to that just for something to do. Uh, they weren't maintained like our, our zoo animals. That's more of the zoo there. Here are them cleaning up some uh, war debris. That building must have got hit in the night by a stray mortar or something. Cleaning that up. The uh, How they lived in Vietnam. That was the average living facility. Regular hellhole over there, guys. Regular hellhole. And that was what I'm talking about my cubicle. So even in war, you got to play the Army Air Force regulations of spot clean. Everything in place. Okay. They come and inspect it every day. They threw you out. And on the bottom, you could see my helmet and flat vest. That went with you everywhere. Wherever you went, that was with you. Because you never know when you're going to be tapped on the shoulder, get on a 18-wheeler and go out and defend something, or you better be ready. Oh, there's the good picture of the cameras. See the big cameras at the bottom? There's a C-130. They were a very popular cargo plane. You still see them flying above. You ever see them? Uh, they sound like a big window. They're orange and silver. The weather planes they use today, they use them for the uh, hurricane, uh, the ones that do the uh, chicken hurricane. Uh, they were very active in the war. I'm trying to find the, uh, the one picture of the... Uh, picture of one of the gunships that you see up there. Radar control guns. They were in the next room back to this one. They're quite amazing. I was just curious which air first base you went to that stuff there. That you you went to that? In my whole career? Yeah. Well even not Griffiths Air Force Base. Uh, Texas, they didn't care for uh, us northerners. South Carolina, they certainly didn't care for us northerners. like Vietnam, and then uh, coming home, I got to Griffiths, excellent food. The town people treat the GIs good, good town. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we conclude? No, except it's been a pleasure. I uh, hope I helped out on somewhat.